Welcome back to Pentagram Prime, everyone. Today we will be looking at exercise number five on page 302 of Marston and Hoffman, where we are asked to evaluate the real improper integral of cosine mx over one plus x to the fourth from zero to infinity, and we will be doing this via residue theorem. Part three from table 431 on page 296 gives us a method for evaluating a similar, though not identical, integral to the one described in exercise five that will be referred to as the integral i. The improper integral of e to the negative i omega x times f of x from minus to positive infinity can be determined by utilizing residues of the integrand in either the upper or lower half of the complex plane, depending upon whether omega is positive or negative. For this method to work, the function f of z must meet a few requirements, including the absence of any zeros on the real axes. In our case, f of z can be described as the quotient of two polynomials, p of z and q of z. p of z is equal to 1, and q of z is 1 plus z to the fourth. The degrees of p and q meet the requirement that q of z, a fourth degree polynomial, have a degree equal to or greater than that of p of z, which in our case is a zeroth degree polynomial. Part 3b shows us that we can use the real component of the aforementioned integral i to determine the value of a real improper integral of the form cosine omega x times f of x from minus to positive infinity. If we substitute m in for omega and assume for the moment that m is positive, then we are instructed by part 3 to use residues located in the lower half of the complex plane and we also need to place an additional minus sign in front of the summation. Of course, we are looking for an integral from zero to infinity as opposed to integrating from minus to positive infinity, so we need to make some changes. Cosine of mx is an even function, as is 1 over 1 plus x to the fourth. The product of two even functions is itself even, and the integral on the right of the origin is equal to its equivalent on the left. Thus, our answer for exercise 5 works out to half of the integral that we're using from part 3b, or half of the real component of the integral i. The only singularities in the integrand of i are those in the function f of z, which for our purposes is 1 over 1 plus z to the fourth, and setting the denominator of f equal to 0 gives us the locations of those singularities. If you manipulate the one on the right by recognizing that 1 equals i to the fourth, then we can show that z to the fourth plus 1 can be rewritten as a set of brackets containing z squared plus i times i squared times a second set of brackets containing z squared minus i times i squared. This expression simplifies into z squared minus i times z squared plus i. The two second-order polynomials break down further into first-order components, each of which contains the square root of i. Expressing i as e to the i pi over 2 and utilizing the formula for the nth root of a complex number where we insert 2 for the value of n as well as pi over 2 for the value of theta, we get e to the i pi over 4 and e to the 5i pi over 4, or e to the i5 pi over 4. It's a mouthful either way. Euler's relation allows us to convert these values into trig functions, and your choice of a slide rule, unit circle, or a TI-85 gives us the values root 2 over 2 plus i root 2 over 2 and minus root 2 over 2 minus i root 2 over 2 for the square root of i. We also have the i root I terms to contend with, and Euler's relation combined with the previously calculated results for root i gives us a path to salvation. The i root i terms work out to the values minus root 2 over 2 plus i root 2 over 2 and root 2 over 
2 minus i root 2 over 2. Plugging these values into our expression for z to the fourth plus 1 shows that the integrand of i has four separate simple poles in the complex plane. Just a reminder that we will sometimes be using x and other times z to represent the integrand of the integral i, depending upon whether or not the function is being represented in the complex plane. Since we are assuming that the variable m is positive, the book asks that we use the residues in the lower half of the complex plane per the listed case of positive omega. Thus, we will be focusing for the moment on the two poles in the lower half of the plane, located at e to the 5i pi over 4 and 7i pi over 4. Since we're dealing with simple poles, we can use proposition 412 on page 244. This requires that we separate the integrand of i into functions g and h for the numerator and denominator respectively. The function g must be non-zero at each pole, h must be zero, and h prime must be non-zero. Note the shortcut that I used for calculating h prime of z, and for your sake, please avoid going down the rabbit hole that is calculating the derivative of the expanded version of h of z. With those requirements satisfied, we have minus e to the i m z naught over 4 z naught to the third power as an expression for the residue of g over h at z naught, and we can now use it to calculate the value of i. Do be mindful of the fact that table 431 has the expression e to the minus i omega z times f of z as the function whose residue we seek, and that it is equal to g over h in this context, with the variable m taking the place of omega. Reminder that for a positive value of m, or omega in the book, we must place a minus sign in front of the summation before adding up the two residues in the lower half of the complex plane. We set up i equal to minus 2 pi i times the sum of the residues at e to the i times 5 pi over 4 and e to the i times 7 pi over 4, located in the third and fourth quadrants respectively. The formula from proposition 412 gives us expressions for the residues and we now must simplify the terms. Most of this is pretty straightforward. I would hope that the viewers of this channel can multiply, say, 3 times 7. Euler's relation helps us convert the exponents in the two numerators, and then we distribute the respective negative i terms. We will pull a factor of 4 out of the denominators as we distribute m in the numerators, and then simplify the first term. The exponential terms in the denominators move to their respective numerators via a sign change in the exponents, and then we lose the respective e terms in favor of adding the exponents together. Next, we combine the latter two terms in each exponent and separate them into their own separate exponential terms. This allows us to factor out a common e to the minus m over root 2 term, and while we're at it, we separate out factors of i from the remaining exponents. Euler's relation comes up again as we convert the two complex exponentials, and then we take the negative i term on the left and distribute it across the four trigonometric functions that we now have. From here, we can now begin to separate the expressions into real and imaginary components by combining the like terms. What remains are properly separated real and imaginary components of the integral i. With the value of the integral i established, we can use it to find the value of the real improper integral cosine of mx over 1 plus x to the fourth from 0 to infinity. As stated in the setup portion of this video, the value of the real integral that we seek is equal to 1 half that of the real component of the integral i that we just calculated. The sum and difference formulas for the sine and cosine functions that I just learned are referred to as Ptolemy's identities, according to the Clark U website, come in handy here, as does knowledge of old school trig, when evaluating sine and cosine functions at both 15 pi over 4 and 21 pi over 4 radians. Root 2 factors out, minus signs combined, and we have pi over 2 root 2 times e to the minus m over root 2 times a set of brackets containing sine m over root 2 plus cosine of 
m over root 2, the video is over, and I can finally go skiing. Except that the video is not over because, well, what if m is less than 0? Or what if we insert negative m where we had positive m before and follow the instructions in table 431 for negative values of omega, which, as discussed, is minus m for our purposes. This has us working in the upper half of the complex plane, and we will refrain from using that minus sign in front of the summation that was present for positive values of omega, once again, per table 431. We will now go through an abbreviated version of what I did for plus m earlier in the video as applied to minus m here. Pay close attention to your eyes and your minus signs, and remind yourself throughout this process that so much of mathematics is less a matter of being a visionary genius slash guru, and more that of an obsessive bookkeeper. When you come out clean on the other side of the hell that is high school algebra, you will be left with the same formula that we got for positive values of m. The integral of cosine of mx over 1 plus x to the fourth from 0 to infinity is the same for plus m as it is minus m, and you may have noticed that I blew past the opportunity to skip a ton of video editing when I ignored the fact that cosine of mx is an even function, making the sine of m irrelevant to the value of the integral. Just in case it wasn't obvious, we should probably touch base on the matter of m equals zero. This episode kind of soured me on Google's equations editor, so I outsourced the rest of my formulas to Wolfram Alpha. As you can see, 1 over 1 plus x to the fourth integrates to pi over 2 root 2 when boundaries are set from 0 to infinity, and this helps us because cosine of mx is equal to 1 when m equals 0. If you substitute m equals 0 into the formula that we just derived, you will get the same result. Hope that ties up any loose ends. Another helpful resource for the purposes of exercise 5 is worked example 437 on page 276 that focuses on an integral involving the quotient of a cosine function with that of an even-powered polynomial. The approach is similar to that of the technique shown in part 3 of table 431, with heavier emphasis on proving that the conditions for use of proposition 436 are met. This example also shows that the value of the integral is only dependent on the absolute value of variable a inside of the cosine function, which acts in a capacity similar to that of the variable m here in exercise 5. There are a couple of updates before we close out. I can no longer afford to produce content in the current format. The editing process is taking too long, and it's cutting into the time that I actually spend uh, solving the problems that form the basis for this channel, so expect an overall change in the aesthetic. The method of narrating detailed slides was originally implemented in order to increase quality, and unfortunately I'm not getting an appropriate increase in quality for the amount of time that I'm spending on animation and script writing. Uh, on a positive note, uh, I recently created a Tumblr account that I am hoping to use for posting solution sheets uh, to the exercises that are featured on Pentagram Prime, as well as a bunch of other ones that never got turned into videos. The link is in the description, and uh, try to give me a couple of days to get something uploaded up there, because right now there isn't even a watermark. Um, Regarding Pentagram Pwned, my gaming channel, I do have gaming content recorded and edited, but I have yet to implement any music, um, so uh, just keep an eye out on that. Finally, uh, thanks to those of you who helped me get to 300 subscribers. Uh, been, a, been a long road. And uh, till next time, this is Pentagram Prime signing off.